start. Cool. I'm going to that we also provide uh, materials and equipment um, that we either sell, uh, lease, or rent. So we're really here to um, introduce to you the partnership that we have with Widelity. And Widelity's, the partnership that we have with Widelity really came from a need that the clients had. And so we quickly realized that we weren't uh, any anywhere near experts in this space. And so Brooke and I were introduced to each other through you know phone numbers being passed in, internally here at Millennium. And so um, I quickly reach out to Brooke and we formalize a partnership and it's it's really just a handshake agreement. We really want you to work directly with Widelity to better understand the funding that's out there. And then obviously we'll be here to help provide support in any way that we can, whether it's the solutions, um, financing um, or uh, equipment. Awesome, thanks, Kevin. Yeah, happy to happy to partner with Millennium for as long as we have and help Millennium clients understand the broadband funding space. So first, this webinar is kind of in two parts. Part one is finding a match of a government program to sort of match your company, match your goals, and match what you want to go after as far as government funds go. And then part two, which is you know more of the focus of matching funds. You know, how do you come up with matching funds? What are matching funds? Why are they required? What are some examples and what are the requirements that go with that? So first off, you know, sort of to set the stage of all the various government funds that are out there, there these are the three, the three big government broadband grant programs that are happening this year in 2023. So to start off, Capital Projects Fund is $10 billion um, for that is being distributed in, in the states, and states are setting up their own programs. So we'll talk about that one in a minute. Also, the USDA Reconnect has 750 million that is projected to open quarter three of this year. And the NTIA bead, which is the big $42 billion that everyone has been talking about for months and months and will continue to talk about um, for time to come is, is the big uh, program that will open up late this year, early next year. So here's just a quick timeline overview of those three big programs. Again, these programs are not exhaustive. There are more programs um, that are smaller in size that are available to you. There are state programs. There are regional programs. Um, the USDA Community Connects program also just opened up on Monday. And so there, this, this is not an exhaustive list, but these are the big, the three big hitters um, for funding. And here's just a quick timeline. Like I mentioned, Capital Projects Fund has, may have already happened in your state or it may be happening right now, or it may be happening in the next couple months. Just depends on where your state is at in the process. And Reconnect will be later this year and Bead will be late this year, early next year. So real quick, I just have one slide on each program to kind of give high level overview. Capital Projects Fund, I call it the mini Bead program uh, because it is only 10 billion, even though 10 billion is still a lot of money uh, for broadband grants. It comes from the Department of Treasury, that is the ultimate entity over this program, and then gets trickled down to the states, and each state gets to design their own grant program that follows the Department of Treasury rules. Things to note here is, like I said, they, this application may have already passed for your state, or it may be happening right now or in the next couple months, so it's important to know what's happening at your state level. If you don't know what is going on at your state and you want to know, um, please reach out. We might have a team who monitors all of this and you know we're looking at all 50 states so we can answer your questions. Um, something to note of this program is that fiber is preferred and that 100 over 100 symmetrical is the preferred speed that they want you to build projects to. Um, and you also have to participate in the FCC ACP affordable connectivity program because they do want an affordable connectivity piece. And again, moving quickly to another program. Again, this is just super high level overview. USDA Reconnect right now has uh, 750 million. There may be more funds added to this, more to come as the rules get announced. This will be for round five and it's projected to open in quarter three of this year. This also has at least round four had a requirement of 100 over 100 service requirement. They are looking for rural unserved areas where 50% of households lack sufficient access. Again, those were the rules for round five or round four. I'm sorry. We'll see what they post for round five. Um, they do have different options at USDA 
you could do a 100% grant, a uh, 50% grant, 50% loan, or a 100% loan. So they do have various uh, funding options with the ReConnect program. And again, the bead at $42 billion, the very large $42 billion will be coming out later this year. You may be hearing in the news or in articles that your state has bead money right now. That does not mean that you missed the boat or you missed the, the, the ship for that program. It simply means that states have funds right now in order to set up this program. They have planning funds that they are using right now in order to prepare, set up their broadband office, prepare their rules, and kind of get their ducks in a row before they open up their program. So just something to note there. Uh, on June 30th, the states will be provided their allocations. So as you can see here, every state has a minimum of $100 million, and the remaining funds will be determined based on a needs-based calculation formula that is going to be connected to the FCC broadband data maps. That information and the state allocations will be announced by the NCIA on June 30th, and I think we will start to see a lot more action and news around this program after that date. Just a note, funds for this program have to be used by 2028 to give you an idea of how much time you have to build these projects. This program does have a different speed requirement of 100 over 20 for projects that are being built. Again, fiber is prioritized for this program, um, but you can see that is the, the speed requirement with low latency and another low cost option. So participating in the FCC ACP program. So like I said, that is not an exhaustive list of all of the programs, but just enough to set the stage, have you be thinking about and monitoring and knowing what programs are out there so that you can find the right program to match what you want to build and where you want to go. Um, so now sort of part two of this is, is more funding focused and match focused. So for all of those programs that I discussed, there are prerequisites on the financial side of things that you will need to take care of and make sure that you have in place in order to apply to these programs. One of those pieces is the irrevocable letter of credit. Sometimes it's abbreviated as the LOC. This is going to be a letter for that you're going to need from your bank guaranteeing some or all of the anticipated grant funds um, for your project. Reason for this is that if you go belly up or if you don't meet the project deadlines, something goes wrong, the state and the government wants a backup plan to be able to recoup their investment. And so that is what this letter of credit is for. It's a sort of financial backing um, that comes from, from your bank. Some states, um, Arkansas, for example, required a 100% um, letter of credit. So if you applied for a $5 million grant, you needed a $5 million letter of credit. Other states only require a percentage. Um, typically, I'm seeing about 25% of your grant amount is the amount they want to see for the, the letter of credit. That letter of credit sometimes can go down over the time of your build um, as you are meeting the requirements and reporting that you are meeting your deadlines. That letter of credit amount can decrease over time. Um, but again, it's going to depend on the rules of the program. And also some states don't require the letter of credit. It's uh, some states desire it, they want it, but they don't necessarily require it. So just something to be aware of. And second, the audited financials. Many programs that we're seeing now are requiring at least two years of independent audited company financials. They want two years because they want a comparative audit. Um, some programs, you have to have the audited financials. For example, Reconnect, the USDA Reconnect, they require those two years audited financials, no ifs, ands, or buts about it. Uh, other programs are a little bit more flexible and they're okay with reviewed financials. And reviewed financials are not as extensive as audited financials. They don't take as much time um, and they are not as expensive. So that is a good um, alternative if your state allows it. And then the third and final piece is, is gap compliance. They, as you're applying to these grants, they want your financials to be in tip top shape. They want you to be gap compliant. If you don't know what that means, you can ask your CPA. Um, it is a specific financial term and they basically really want meticulous accounting for your revenues, your inventory, your uh, assets and your depreciation rates of those assets. 
and identifying every single line item if it is connected to a project and which project it's connected to. If it's not connected to a project, if it's an overhead or an indirect cost, they want that for every single line item of your books. And um, you know, reason being, if you are awarded these grants, you're going to have to be very meticulous with what you are using these grant funds for. And if it is for this project, then it is from this grant and it is from this pool of money. Um, so they're just setting you up for success to be prepared shall you win these grant funds. Um, so just some things to, to be aware of. So what are matching funds? Matching funds are funds that, as you are applying to these grants, both the state and federal level require this match, which are outside funds to be provided by the applicant. So the main applicant is the one party who is responsible for supplying these matching funds. These can be, you may have heard the term in kind or cash. The state or the government wants to see you bringing some skin into the game. You are going to be turning a profit on this project you know, you're getting grant funds to build this infrastructure that you are running your business off of and therefore eventually turning a profit over. So they want you to bring some some money to the table. Um, They're bringing a, a lot of taxpayer dollars. They also want you to bring some some skin into the game and have kind of a stake in the project financially. So the applicants, as you're applying, must show that you have these matching funds during the application phase. You can't wait until after you get awarded. You have to have it at application time and know where those funds are coming from and be able to document and show those funds. Now, depending on the program will depend on how much matching funds you have to bring to the table. If you are interested in the bead program, for example, the NTIA at the federal level requires a 25% match at a minimum. Now, as the states design their programs and di design their rules, they could say, no, we are going to require a 30% match or a 35 or a 45% match. So it will come down to the states on if they make that number a little bit higher, but the minimum is going to be a 25%. For reconnect, like I said, reconnect requires a cash match. That's going to be a 25% match and it has to be cash. Bead and capital projects fund do allow for an in-kind match. And I'm going to talk about what that means more specifically here in a minute. Um, and then finally, capital projects fund, the amount of match is going to depend on the state. Some states are not requiring a match, but then they give you more points for the more match that you bring to the table. Um, some sort of a, a standard is 20%. Um, that would be sort of a standard to, to expect when you're applying to a grant program. And the last point I want to make is that like I said, you're going to be scored on your grant because these are competitive grants. You're going to be scored against other applicants. And every state has a scoring guide. In that scoring guide, it will say how many points you get associated with potentially bringing a match to the table. So in usually those are the highest weighted categories. If you look at the points across the board, you're going to get the most points for bringing the most match to the table. So something to definitely look at as you are preparing to apply to these programs. So what are your options? How do you come up with 25% of a $5 million grant? Um, there's a couple of options. You can, if you have the cash, that's, that's the easiest one, bring the cash to the table. Uh, if the rules allow it, and they say that they allow for in-kind match, that's another good alternative. And I'll talk about what in-kind match means here in a minute. Uh, you can also use other governmental funds, which I will talk about, but you, for BEAD, you can use Capital Projects Fund or um, ARPA funds to be able to, to bring a match to the table. You can also utilize private equity, and Kevin's going to talk about that one here in a little bit. Um, you could also leverage partnerships. Partnerships could be a wide range of things. It could be a public-private partnership. The government loves to see those public-private partnerships in a county contributing actual dollars and funds to your project. It really shows that the county, or it could be a city as well, are backing your project. And if you can build a partnership with a municipal government and they bring some funds to the table, uh, that's, that's a, a nice bonus. Other partnerships could be 
um, you know, you could get creative with this piece. If there's people in the community that want to financially contribute to your company and support you and your project because they really want broadband in their city, that's an option. Um, another one is if there's a big manufacturing company, like uh, I talked to someone who was near the Tyson factory and they really wanted fiber and internet to their, their factory in order to increase their business. Well, if they are going to financially partner with you and financially back your project or your plan, that might be a creative way to sort of recruit funds for, for matching. Um, and then finally, a bridge loan. And Kevin can, can speak about that one here in a bit as well. So let's talk about in-kind matching. In-kind matching are any, it depends on the state, and if you've heard me talk before, you hear me say that all the time, Kevin probably is sick of me saying it depends on the state, but it, it, it depends on how they design the rules for in-kind and what is allowable. Typically, if it is an allowable or eligible expense for the project, then it can be used as an in-kind match. So for example, if you have a yard full of conduit that you're going to be able to use for, for a project, and you can bring that, that conduit asset has a dollar amount. You can associate that dollar amount to, to the match and say, I'm going to basically donate all of this conduit to this project. And as long as you can associate a dollar amount to that, um, that could be considered an in-kind match. Any sort of assets that you have on hand um, or own can be utilized as long as you can prove that they are necessary for the project that you're proposing to do. Other examples could be um, salary for your staff. If you, are, if you have construction crew or staff members who are gonna be doing administrative work, any sort of staff member who's going to be working on this project, you can use their salary amount as an in-kind contribution. Now, that, that staff member is likely not going to be working on this project 100% of the time. So typically what happens is you take maybe 50% or 25% of that person's salary and you associate a dollar amount to that, show them the calculation, show them the reasoning, and associate that dollar amount to your in-kind contribution. Um, additionally, polls, if you have, if you own polls and you're going to be utilizing those polls for the project, you can you know, donate them to the project and associate a dollar amount to that. So hopefully you're seeing that this is one of the reasons why the gap compliance is so important is you know, having every single line item in your books identified with a specific project, a specific dollar amount, your depreciation assets, having all of that up front makes it easier or make it make sense once you're applying those in-kind assets to, to your match contribution. Um, additionally, you can bring some cash equivalents like stocks or bonds. And as with anything with government funding, you must document all of these in-kind contributions, estimate or associate a dollar amount or a value to it, and show how they are directly related and directly required for the proposed project. They must be required for the build that you are going to do. Um, so this one is, is usually the most complex for, for matching funds. Um, but if you are going to be using an asset or if you have an asset that is going to be required for a project in this area, then, then you can use it and associate that dollar amount to your in-kind match. And so this next one is also a little tricky. It's government funds. So with the BEAD program, there are new rules that we haven't seen before where some government funding like Capital Projects Fund or ARPA funds can be used for a match contribution towards the BEAD project and towards your BEAD grant. And so if you do that, you must keep in mind that you have to follow the rules and the requirements for both programs. Because you're taking funding from both buckets, you have to follow both rules. Um, and they must be allowable by the program rules and you cannot overlap those funds. So something um, that we say often is you can't double dip. You can't use funds from ARPA and funds from B to, stay, to pay for that same equipment. Again, another reason to be gap compliant so that every single line item is associated with a specific project and you can clearly document and show that you aren't double dipping and using funds for two sets of funds for one thing. 
Um, this one is tricky, I say, because we haven't seen how it's actually going to unfold yet. Uh, we haven't seen an example of a, if there's funding from the state that's available. And I think we will learn and see more as we get closer to the bead applications towards the end of this year. Um, what I would recommend for this one is if you are interested in using state or I'd be more county or city local ARPA funds for your bead match is start building relationships with your county, start building relationships with your city if you haven't done so already. And, you know, get them to, to trust you, know your business, know that you're a local provider, know what your intentions are, where you want to build, what you want to do. And so that when the bead application time does come, you can go speak to them and say, hey, do you have any ARPA funds left over? If they have ARPA funds left over, they could contribute that towards your bead matching funds. And now I'm going to hand it over to Kevin to talk about the private equity piece. Yeah. So, Brooke, thanks for touching on those items. And, and you know, I would recommend that you exhaust um, all those opportunities. And I think even reach out to the community to see if there's any private, um, you know, funds that could be put towards uh, the projects. And, you know, there's a number of ways of going after it. I'd love to, you know, kind of share some ideas um, if or when you're interested. You know, I think uh, most of you will know that the banks will give out loans and there's private equity out there and there's there's pros and cons with each one of those. Um, and it really is a good space and probably where you should start, um, at least to be considering the different uh, the different options that you may have um, on the front end. It should be the place where you're you're really starting to think about you know, where do I want to be um, when this project's done or when the projects that I've been funded have been done? What, what, what does my company look like when I'm, I'm finished here? And does private equity make sense? Um, and, you know, there's a number of things that come into play when you're talking to private equity. There's different opportunities to, you know, bring in a partner um, like private equity and help you really steer your company in a direction that's profitable and makes sense for the long term. Um, but it might not be a fit for what your overall ambitions are, you know, and so a bank might make more sense where they have less um, requirements or less constraints on what you can and can't do as you're building your company, but it'll be specific to that funding program. So um, on the next slide, um, we've, we've found a place that's somewhere between the public funding the private equity, the banks, and we've created the Millennium Infrastructure Fund. And it's a 506B, so we, we work with private investors um, to provide funding for um, providers to essentially either be a match for your uh, the fund you're going after or to um, help accelerate your, uh, your growth plans. Um, it really is a way to infuse um, capital into your fund and really take advantage of the prices as they are today. Um, get a, a you know labor where it's at today, and then as as well as get equipment um, at the cost it is today. So it, it really makes sense on many levels because then you're not uh, you know meeting the same requirements as a bank or a private equity, but you can still build like as if it's your own cash. Um, obviously, would work with you to get it paid back and whatever the exit strategy is, and we'll stay very close to you and uh, be a partner in that action. Next slide. So really, you know, the thing that we want to hammer home is that, you know, from all the things that Brooke mentioned is um, through public funding, the public private uh, partnerships, um, and of course, private equity, banking, and then the Millennium Infrastructure Fund, it really is a um, space to where you're trying to work through, you know, what makes sense for you as a provider. And, um, and we're there to work with you very closely to understand what makes sense um, to, um, to really help you be successful and what success looks like for, looks like for you. Um, you know, some people might not be uh, interested in talking to private equity. And so we can walk through that with you. What does it mean to be successful? And then really have an exit strategy out of the different funding programs and the 
compliance. And that's why we work with Brooke and the team at Widelity because they really work very closely with us to understand where the challenges and the pitfalls can be and really try to help you be successful. And so when we say that we we're teamed together, we really do team together to try to navigate all of the different funding and uh, money that's out there today. Yeah, Kevin, do you have any any sort of client examples of of what matching funds that they've brought to the table in the past? Yeah, no, that's a great, great question. So, um, and I know your team, yeah, because I forgot to mention it. So where we find success is when we have a client that um, has been awarded significant funds. And many of you know the story. You basically have to be successful at building a network to get the actual funds. And so we've worked with clients to help fund them on the front end of their projects. And they've gone through, built their network um, and already starting to see revenue. Um, and they're actually able to pay back the loan with just the revenue alone. And now they're getting the public funding start coming in. So they're in a great position to not only continue to grow, but even be in a position to acquire other companies. And so that's been a very exciting and really um, rewarding to see, uh, you know, providers that are going to areas of the country that would never have had a chance to um, get broadband if it wasn't for the partnership um, with between the private funding that we do through the Millennium Infrastructure Fund and the public funding that they're now getting because they successfully have built their network. Yeah, that's awesome. Without getting into specifics, but there's some great examples and, you know, I'd love to share with you one-on-one -on -one if ever you would like to know more, but uh, there's a lot of stories out there. People have successfully worked with us um, to get uh, broadband deployed to parts of the country that would have not otherwise been able to get it. Yeah, and another example that I can think of from a previous client of, of matching funds is they they couldn't bring cash match because they just didn't have the cash on hand. So they went the in-kind uh, route for matching funds and they needed, they had in their budget already to get certain equipment for their network because they, they budgeted it for that year and they needed that equipment anyways for their network. Well, in order to build the grant fund that project that they were applying for, they also needed that. Um, but because they already put it in their yearly budget, they already budgeted for it. They're like, okay, well, we can use this as an in-kind contribution because we have we are going to pay for it anyways. Um, but we also need it in order to to build this project to this specific area. So that's just a, an example of something. If you are tight for cash or tight for resources, if you have something already in your budget for the year that you need to purchase, if it can be also utilized for the grant project that you're proposing and it's required for you to meet the speed requirements or to meet that project build, then it can also be used as an in-kind asset. So just a, another example of a, of a past client. Yeah, and that's something that, you know, when we're working with you, we'll try to understand what you already have for some of your in-kind um, solutions. Um, if you work with a bank already, we'll work very closely with the bank. And if you're in early conversations with a private equity, um, we'll really put all of those different solutions together to understand exactly where like the Millennium Infrastructure Fund would fit in for you so that it's not something you're strapped with for a long period of time and, and really um, try to understand what that looks like uh, from, you know, from a success story, right? So basically working very closely with even your bank um, representative or whatever, just to make sure that we understand what your um, what your profit needs to be at in, it, in that so we can structure the loan so that it, it fits through every, all the different um, uh, phases of your build project or the building your project. Awesome. So what's next? Um, now and for the last few months, I think I have been preaching uh, that preparation is key. In order to be ready for these applications that are opening, it is utterly super duper important to start preparing now. Get a plan together before the application window opens. Some of these application windows we are noticing are only 30 days and they are lightning speed. And if you are not ready to go with a plan, then you're behind. So some things that you can be doing now to prepare for these funding opportunities are get your audited financials done now. The CPAs are very busy with tax season and audited financials can take months and months to get done. So get, get that right now if you haven't done so already. 
uh, start talking to your bank about a letter of credit, even though you don't need it today. If an application window is only 30 days, you're not gonna have a whole lot of time to get your ducks in a row. So start talking to the bank, start saying this might be a requirement. What is What paperwork, what documentation do you, does the bank need in order to obtain this letter of credit quickly? Um, and then start creating your, your plan, your technical plan, your budget, you know, where do you want to build? What do you want to build? How are you going to build it? And, um, you know, how many miles is it going to be? This is all of your project plan is going to determine your budget, which you also should start to be preparing. And then that budget is then going to influence your match. You know, that, that plan, that project plan, that project budget will influence how much percentage of a match you're going to need to bring to the table. Because again, if you have only 30 days to figure out if you're going to do a cash or an in-kind or what kind of match you're going to bring to the table, that's something that you want to have figured out beforehand. Um, so these are just some some preparation tips and things to to get started on as you may be waiting for an application window to open up. And, and I would argue that some of these activities are things you should be doing on a daily basis too. Um, I mean, it really should be part of your overall strategy to grow, um, even if it's only to grow to a certain area and, and just that's the area you're going to serve it. All of this should be part of your general plan because um, quite honestly, it'll set you up to be successful in other places of um, your business, not, not just on public funding or private funding, but it could very well be in situations where you want to you know, um, partner with someone else or even merge or, or uh, be acquired by another company. So these are the type of things that you should be thinking about on a regular basis and start to put um, some of these actions into place, um, regardless of what you decide to do with funding. Yeah, absolutely. So now I'm going to hand it over to Evan for some questions. Yeah. So thank you to everyone that's been um, throwing questions in that Q&A feature. Um, we're going to be going over some of those. Um, if you have any other questions, please don't hesitate to throw them down into that Q&A feature. So we already have Brooke and Kevin here, so let's get some of their expertise. So for you guys, the first question I'm seeing here is that, is it a good idea to give more than the minimum match percentage? And if so, how much more? Yeah, so like I said, it's going to be connected to the scoring guide of the state. But yes, it's definitely, if you can bring more match to the table than the minimum, that's going to make your application more competitive. The more match you bring, the more points you're going to get. Uh, like I said, the, the sort of standard is 20%. Some of the programs like you saw is a minimum of a 25%, but the more the more funding you can bring, the more points you'll get, the more competitive your application is going to be. The government wants to see your financial investment into the project. Uh, so the more you can make that a stronger case, the more you know likelihood they're going to fund your project. Yeah, and like anything else, I think one of the things to think about is like there could be several pieces of the matching fund, and it's important to continue to work through the different options that you have for um, the funding. So if it's in kind, you still want to get some cash uh, matching, um, obviously the public private uh, partnership that Brooke mentioned, I think all of those options should be exhausted and to make sure you're exceeding that minimum amount to match. Cause then it really shows like a good effort towards um, what your plan is and to get the funding. Um, and quite honestly, it'll open up a lot of doors as far as um, other partnerships and uh, really put you in a better place to be successful. All right, awesome. Our next question is, could you theoretically combine your cash and in-kind matching sources to come up with a total match for a program? Uh, historically, yes, you can. Uh, it will depend on the rules of the program. So for example, reconnect. Reconnect is cash only. Uh, you cannot use in-kind, but uh, BEAD and Capital Projects Fund are allowing for in-kind to be used. And so historically, if in-kind is allowed to be used, then you can use a combination and you can sort of bring multiple different things. You know, that slide where I had all the options of different funding sources for matching, it could you can use cash and in-kind together and sort of combine it to bring a, a total package to the table. 
Well, thank you. Um, this one seems fitting given we were just talking about some audited financials. So for those audited financials, could you use an in-house accountant? Typically, no, unless the, the rules say otherwise. They want an independent uh, CPA or an independent accountant to, to do your books. They don't want somebody internally. They want somebody externally giving it kind of a third party neutral view. Um, and that's usually noted in, in the rules if they want an independent accountant. But usually I would err on the side of, of going outside. Um, and something else I don't remember if I mentioned, but if, if you are not ready for audited financials and you aren't ready for that financial commitment to get audited financials, uh, a, a plan B could be to get reviewed financials. Getting a two-year reviewed financials isn't going to cost as much as audited financials. And if you go with a CPA firm that has the ability to do audited financials, you can go back to that CPA when the time comes and say, hey, I, this program actually requires audited financials. Can you, can you do my financials and make them audited? And it's a more affordable turnaround and it's easier for a, that CPA firm who's already looked at your books to go from a reviewed state to an audited state. Um, so that is something that I do recommend to clients who can't afford audited financials right now, or they don't wanna make that total commitment unless they absolutely have to, uh, going with reviewed first as step one and then audited as a plan B um, is, is a good solution. Okay, um, I am seeing some questions about if the presentation will be um, uh, sent afterwards. Um, after this call has ended, we will be following up with a recording of this call and as well as the presentation for you guys and for your references. Um, I'm seeing another question asking if they could add equipment to maintain their system as well. Examples would be like splicing equipment, drills, trucks, etc. So typically costs for for operation and maintenance is not an allowable expense under these program rules if it has to be for construction that is going to be needed in order to to do the build if it's if it's operational cost then it's not going to be covered by infrastructure grant funding it's um you know if that equipment is required for the build of the project then you could make an argument for it but if you use anything on the term of operations or maintenance, they are not going to be a likely eligible expense. And if it's not a likely eligible expense, then it won't be a likely eligible matching contribution. Okay, looks like we are getting down to the bottom of the barrel, but I do have one more for you guys. So what do you, I need to show or what can I use for documentation to show um, my state, my matching funds? So in order to, to show the matching funds, some options, you know, if it's cash, it's going to be bank statements, um, letters of commitment. If you have a partnership, a letter from the city or the county, if you're having a public private partnership of how many dollars and they are contributing to your project. If you're doing an in-kind match, they're going to want to see documentation of your of your books and that that asset that you are donating or contributing as an in-kind match, what that dollar amount is. So, you know, visibility into into your books on your equipment and depreciation rates and, you know, what that dollar amount value is um, are, are some examples of, of documentation. Yeah, and to add on to that, so uh, we've provided uh, letters of intent to fund if, in mm -hmm. fact, the provider has been awarded, which has helped um, providers be successful with um, programs for the last year or so. Um, that's been a very good use of a tool, and it really will provide the the dollar amount that you need, and then work with you, um, you know, after you're funded to structure, you know. Uh, you know, basically from the Millennium Infrastructure, we'd structure the loan to be, um, you know, something that works for you for the with the way you've planned it. And we'll work real closely with you on that. I mean, we'll truly try to understand, um, you know, what's needed to to build out a particular area or areas that you believe you're going to get funding for. Um, and it's great because, you know, since we are a company that provides um, engineering, um, 
and uh, material, we can really put together a good strategy around the right solutions um, to make uh, to make sense for the program. Yeah, and then to, to add a final note onto that, I was thinking as you're building your grant budget, you're going to have a spreadsheet of every cost that is associated and every cost that you want to get covered by these grant funds. In that spreadsheet, you'll also have a matching section where you can add the matching funds that you plan to contribute to the project. And if that's cash or in kind, and then you can you know document line by line what that is, how much it is, where it's coming from. There's always narratives, which are basically just paragraphs on describing what those matching funds are, where they're coming from, and you know, developing a plan for how and when you're going to be using those matching funds. And you know, the biggest thing with with grants is just documentation, showing proof of the the equipment or the asset, and showing documentation, and then explaining how it's going to be utilized. Okay, looks like I am all out of questions from the Q&A portion. So Brooke, Kevin, I will hand it back off to you guys to say some last words. I'll let you go first, Brooke. Okay, awesome. Well, thank you, Evan, and thank you, Millennium, for having me on this webinar today. I appreciate it. I uh, love partnering with you guys and, you know, just happy to be a resource for anything government funding. If you have any questions about programs, what's specifically going on in your state, um, what the rules are, how to apply, how to navigate this whole entire funding space. My contact in our website is linked here. And like Evan said, we will send this out so you can have access to, to these slides. Yeah, Brooke, thanks for being such a good partner. I mean, this is one space that we don't really get involved in and we love that you'll come in and um, really take care of the clients and really help them understand what it takes to be successful and get the funding that they would, you know, would like to get. Um, you know, we're here to really work closely with Brooke and her team. So if there's anything you need throughout the process, um, you know, Brooke pulls us in and says, hey, can you jump in and, you know, take a look at this? Um, we've got people on our, on my team that will even walk you through the different opportunities that are out there. And also, um, you know, walk you through uh, where we wouldn't recommend um, you know, building for whatever reason. So we're not just going to push you to build. We'll really try to understand the area that you want to serve and whether it makes sense to um, build fiber to a particular area or use wireless, for example. We're not just going to steer you one direction and really try to understand where it makes sense um, to, to build or not to build. Um, and we're really here to help if you need you know, any questions answered. And then, of course, we've got, you know, the 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 material side of things, um, you know, as that's evolving and lead times are either up or down, depending on what's going on the, on the market, we really want to understand what your plan is and when you need to be finished by. So we want to be out in front of that as much as possible. So we're really here to help and it works great working with Brooke and her team at Widelity. So you've got the contact information here. We look forward to hearing from you and uh, hope best, best of luck the rest of March, either it's your, you know, March Madness squares or, uh, um or your uh or your funding awesome thanks everybody thank you all right thank you everyone